Hey, everybody, this is Christian Buckley with another Post Tweet Jam Takeaways. I'm here with David, and uh, great to have you. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Christian. So why don't you introduce yourself uh, real quick? So my name is David Drever. Uh, I am a Microsoft MVP five times uh, in the Office Apps and Services uh, category. I uh, started in SharePoint, uh, SharePoint Online. Uh, I dabble a bit in uh, Power Platform and, and, you know, all the good stuff along there. Um, I'm also a senior manager and enterprise architect with Portivity. And you are based in? I am based in Crossfield, Alberta, uh, which I know you probably haven't heard of that place. It's just north of Calgary, which I know you have heard of that one. So about 15 minutes from Calgary. Yes, we were talking about previously, it's like I, I've been uh, meaning to get that part of where I've flown over, you know, yep. between you know, Toronto and Ottawa and British Columbia and just have never made it to the middle of the country there. But uh, I've been talking for years about getting up and and seeing the, uh, you know, the, the you know, the activities that happen in that part of the world. There's a lot yep. of a lot of cool stuff. So. Um, but let's let's jump into it. This is an interesting topic, and I know that so it's in our sweet spot. So it's you know SharePoint, SharePoint and Teams, and kind of collaboration and knowledge management, kind of everything that's involved in that. But the topic of the Tweet Jam this month was planning for the hybrid workplace. And you know a lot of that kind of stems from you know, the, uh, the the article that Satya Nadella wrote out on LinkedIn, where he's talking about like that work-life balance that differs in the paradox between wanting to have flexibility that again that work-life balance. I want to be able to manage my own time, but at the same time, I want to be in it. I want to be constantly in contact with everybody. Mm -hmm. And that's that paradox. Like, how do we do that? And I, I liken it to like, I want to live in that rural life, but I want to be, you know, five minutes away from the box stores and the movie theaters. So I, basically what I want is I want to live in a house in the middle of Central Park. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's okay. what, that's what people want. That's the paradox. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so anyway, so it was a great discussion. We had a decent turnout, a uh, lot of great interaction there. But let's jump right in with question number one and get your thoughts on this. So what does it mean to adopt a hybrid work operating model? Yeah, and, and that's that was a great start to the, to the tweet jam. And, and one of the things that I find when when someone says they want to adopt the hybrid model is, is they just mean they think, I just want to be able to work from home. But it, it, it really is more than that. It's the ability to work from anywhere at any time whether you're you know, at the office, whether you're at home, whether you're on a plane, like being able to do that at any time, but also being engaged, you know, engaging your people. And, and, and that's a big thing right now is being able to engage the people. Um, one of the things I, I remember from the tweet jam was that uh, Kevin McConnell made a point. He says, being able to work in, at your office, in your home or any place with no issues continuing where you're left off. And that's a big thing, being able to go from one place to the other, one you know, one location to the other, and still continue work and interact with others. You know, I I kind of I didn't mention it. I I thought about this, and I think I just got sidetracked by the discussion. But I was thinking of some of the parallels again around that idea of a hybrid operating model around that, and thinking about some of the same things that you know we would talk to customers about uh, about um, digital transformation, saying, mm -hmm. look, it's not just about uh, the the technology, the tools themselves. It's about realigning people, process, and technology. It's mm -hmm. it's all of those things. And so hybrid is like obviously to the the core piece of hybrid is that where we have people that may be remote. You have people that might be in the office, and they might some people might go back and forth between those. Yep. But um, you know it, it's it, but it's not just like one thing. It's not just hey, I'm going to go deploy Microsoft Teams. And hey, we're hybrid. We're good. Yeah. It doesn't it's not quite that. work like that. Yeah. No. no. So this question two was: What are three business benefits to a hybrid workplace? So I had a couple of things that came to mind, and a lot of it, honestly, is you know, even think about your office space. You, if if you would fully adopt a hybrid office space, it usually a workplace. It means that you're probably not going to have your full team in the office every day. You don't need to worry about that. So I actually see the need to maintain a constant office space for everybody is going to vastly decrease. Um, you still need to have that, but maybe you don't need to, have, maybe you have a rental place, you know? Yeah. I still think there's going to be some of that. Um, I think one of the biggest things is that we've already, already realized is you don't need to book your, your meetings around the availability of a boardroom. 
that was that's a huge thing. Um, I know, like even you know, three or four years ago, if I wanted to have a meeting, it wasn't about getting everybody else available. It was about finding a boardroom. You well, it's years. We used to just go, like we would give up on looking for meetings and go uh, uh, meet, uh, you know, it, not during lunchtime, but in the cafeteria. Yep, that did that many times too. So, um, and what I always found too was that a hybrid workplace means flexibility. Employees love flexibility. And when you have, uh, you know, uh, an employee feels like they're being, you know, being a catered to to a certain extent, you know, it makes a happier employee. Happier employee tends to work a little bit better, more efficiently. And in the end, a hybrid workplace could actually be an overall benefit for the organization because you your employees are, tend to be a little happier because they see that the business is, or the, uh, the management is trying to work with them uh, at the same time. So maybe they'll be a little more efficient and overall the business uh, improves. I think another benefit too is especially it, it, it really it's so I know with geographically dis, dispersed organizations you know finding uh, the right person for the right role and and I think there was a couple of people who made the same comment that said you know you don't have to like find the perfect fit that person for that role but then they're unwilling or unable to move and then mm-hmm. you have to keep looking for that so it gives more flexibility in the hiring process to find the, those people. I'm I'm a perfect example. I'm the farthest west employee of of Protivity in Protivity Canada, and I was hired. My ne- my nearest neighbor is in uh, Ottawa, so you know I was a perfect example of that. It's good to have a little bit of space, though. It so does. <laughs> no one no one's dropping in and while you're in your pajamas working there. So you. <laughs> well, I guess that's another benefit. You know, the pants are optional. I guess, but. <laughs> oh yeah, I have the. Uh... So I, I have the stickers for that. Oh, so, there you go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So that that's, uh, I, I mean, I think there's, there's definitely the, you know, operating costs can, can go down your, uh, you know, not having to pay for that space or, and so repurpose a lot of that space. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, a lot of flexibility around that. Well, question number three, uh, for organizations struggling to transition to a hybrid workplace, Where's the greatest friction and why? So there's a couple of friction points to be to be fair to be honest. Um, I think a lot of times, let's be honest here, the pandemic really forced a lot of this on people and uh, organizations. A lot of organizations, they weren't ready. So they didn't have the technology in place. They didn't have the hardware in place to support their, their users. And that is still an issue today. Um, and you made the point as well too. You said, you know, I install two teams or I install Zoom and I get we're, we're hybrid. That's not the case. People have to know how to use the tools. They know how to, you know have to be able to work together. So I think it's another friction point is the training and the tools that they're going to be getting. But I think the biggest friction point was actually a culture change, because historically management they think in order to get the work done you have to have people butts and seats, and at the office. And and I think they've quickly learned through this whole pandemic that that isn't necessarily the case. Work is still getting done. Goals are still being met. People are being able to do this all from home. But that's a culture change. And I think I, I still see um, and things I've heard, a lot of businesses, as soon as they can open up the office, they want to get people back in there. Um, so I still think that that is probably going to be the biggest friction point um, of this whole hybrid model is, is the culture change. I think another one too is just you know people having to go out and buy the hardware to be able to do yeah. that. I mean, obviously not everybody, and we saw this even in you know education with all yeah. the kids that were you know home for the pandemic. You know, and I was thinking, I, I so I grew up in a big family. And I was thinking, what a nightmare that would have been. I'm the second oldest of ten kids. Yeah. yeah when I was a teenager, and there was the most you know kids at home during that period. Um, you know, had we had the technology in the uh, early '80s. Uh, for a lot of it, it still would have been a struggle to have multiple kids, you know, mm-hmm. and parents trying to get work done. Um, so the, the, those issues. But then there's other stuff, just buying the cameras and lights and microphones and headsets yeah. and and laptops for those that had desktop units in the office, those kinds of things. So it was the, the hardware dilemma. Well, when I started this whole thing, um, working remotely and, and things like that, it wasn't a huge deal. But when it became the only way to do things... Um, my webcam was easily 10, 11 years old, and you could not find a webcam anywhere. It right. was impossible. And so, yeah, so that, like, exactly. If even that's a perfect example, not having the hardware in place. You know, so I've been working from home since uh, the middle of, since summer of 2009. Okay. 
you know, so I've been doing this for a while. Um, and, uh, and the greatest friction that I had was more on the people that in the, the process side is that when you're, uh, you know, and it's, it, it's still a problem, even with everyone remote is getting people to remember that everyone else is remote or when those that go back to the office, hopefully they won't forget that there are people that are dispersed that are out there. And so, you know, they, they need to, to remember that in their interactions, you know, are mm-hmm. we including everybody that needs to be included? What is the right way to engage with all those people? But, uh, and this goes back to, I think, one of the business benefits. I think uh, regardless of the size of your organization, I think we're we're also going to be more prepared for, you know, globalization of, of companies as they expand and grow. Yeah. So that's definitely a positive as well. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So the, the next one, I was trying to get more specific because I know that we hear a lot about... Uh, you know, uh, well, what we'll hear a lot about, we, we live in meetings, mm-hmm. you know, so a lot of work gets done or doesn't get done via meetings. So question four was how can organizations improve the way they hold meetings? And there's, there's, and th- this is a great question. And so it's, a, it's probably one of the hardest questions we had today. Uh, and the reason being is that there's lots of answers, but it's, it's hard to follow through on those answers. Um, I think the biggest thing is for an organization to build and adopt some rules and guidelines around that. And it has to be at the organization. It has to be at the top level because, um, and what I mean is, you know, you know, have, you know, think about things like, you know, don't start a meeting until five minutes after, 10 minutes after the hour or, or something along that line or finish it early. Give people time to decompress from the meeting before they have to jump on another meeting. Um, and I'm sure you can attest to this since people have gone hybrid, remote, uh, that sort of thing, because you're not having to add time to get from one meeting room to another, you just jump from one call, jump to the other wall call. And what's become a huge thing in the last year, two years, is a, is a concept of meeting fatigue. Yeah. And, 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 and users are, and well, everyone is just like, I'm so tired of meetings, I can't get anything done. And I think organizations have to develop rules and guidelines around, you know, minimize meetings to um, like you know three or four meetings a day to get some work done the problem ha, is this, ha, wait <laughs> 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 again i said i didn't say it's anything it's easy to adopt and the same that they, they, they kind of need to do you theorists i don't think really, it's crazy <laughs> yeah no but i but i get so, it yeah you know it, it's it's um it's having the concept of of less than eight meetings a day is, is unheard of. And, you know, how do you get any work done? Right. So it's, it's things like that. You encourage techniques to, to cope with the meeting fatigue, um, have days, you know, block time off where you, you can't have meetings in that time frame, so you can get some work done or just, you know, decompress things like that. Um, is there, I don't, somebody brought up like the suggested and I kind of added on to it, um, during the, uh, the tweet jam, somebody had said like, you know, enforce having agendas beforehand yep. and i commented like back in my you know pmo days so back in the 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 mid to late uh 90s and i carried it forward for for years where like you don't even hold a meeting if it doesn't have in fact there were people who refused to attend a meeting if there's mm-hmm. not an agenda they would just not show up for that yep. if it wasn't that organized it's just a waste of their time and i think that is it's it's not a bad policy like i don't want to be the guy having to enforce that but mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's nice to have that as a best practice and drive that cultural change in an organization to have that up front. Yeah, that's that's and that was a great idea and and uh, I I've met people like that too. They won't come to a meeting if there's no agenda. They'll they'll respond. I'm not coming to your meeting. Give me an agenda, then I'll come to your meeting. Right. So you know it's not you know, a bad idea. Some of the most successful uh, you know governance groups that I've run. So again, back in the kind of that that era and and uh, in operations were where we had that agenda and we had a specific structure to that. And and so based on items that were submitted as part of the process for this regular, this recurring meeting, and if there were no items on it or only one, we would hold that item until there were more than one. And so we had, again, it just became part of the culture, the motion of this governance body um, to, to meet that uh, we just didn't wanna waste people's time and want to be productive that way. And so there's nothing wrong with getting in, getting stuff done and saying, okay, hey, we had blocked out 45 minutes. We took 10 minutes, we're done. Thank you very much, go. 
I, you know, it, it, even to this, like today, you know, you say, I can give you 15 minutes of your day back. The, the, the happiness on people's faces when you say stuff like that is, so, you know, it's, it's unreal. It is. It's a good thing. Yeah. And of course, there's other ways too. There's other things that are out there, like you have like the whiteboard capability. Um, mm -hmm. one of the things that else, the, the the other tip that I they have in the Microsoft Teams world, uh, is I'm a big believer in the default recording of internal meetings, so that it's captured, so that stream mm -hmm. goes through and does the transcription. It's automatically searchable. It's part of your knowledge base. So. Meetings are an important information asset. It's part of the IP that your company creates. Um, I, I think, and there's nothing wrong with turning off the recording depending on the content of the meeting, but by default, having that there and capturing that record and, and letting other people go back and review that, but also making it searchable, I think is uh, is a good best practice yeah and it's it's not it depends on the industry i know there's some industries that can't do that um but uh and that's not a topic for today but uh um it's it's a great idea because you know sometimes you can't make the meeting and it's just not possible but you need to be able to participate having that turned on being able to go back and watch it and then maybe um providing feedback after the fact it's it's a great way of uh, doing that you know, you want people that don't show up for the meetings to pay attention to what you covered in a meeting. You record it and just tell them it's a cool new podcast. Yeah. And maybe they, they'll listen to <laughs> <Maybe>. it. <laughs> yeah, totally. That one time that you tricked them into listening to your meeting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, so question number five. So what are the greatest gaps in technology? So specifically talking about yeah. the te technology when adopting a hybrid work model. So you have to have the technology in place before you can say we're high before you go hybrid if you're if you're in an organization that provides desktops to your organ to your to your people it's not going to work because you can't pack that desktop up in the monitor and take it wherever you want to go it's just not possible um you need to have this software in place too you need to have a way to collaborate whether it's you know teams and sharepoint or any other tool that we don't want to talk about um you know <laughs> Yeah, there. I've heard there are other platforms, other tools, and things that are out there, all vastly lesser than, of course. You know, Microsoft you know, 360. You know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. But that's and that's and that's the thing. You need to have all of that in place, and and that's what I was finding. Um, and, and actually, the the adoption of the hybrid, and it, we always come back to this piece, is that when the, when the pandemic started. Everyone was scrambling because they were. All, everyone was told it wasn't a case of the business being told. It was a case of the, of the government telling the business your people have to work from home. Well, if they can, don't have those, they don't have the technology. They don't have the the laptops. They don't have the webcams. They don't have the mics. Um, it's not. It's not going to be. It's not going to be possible if you don't have a Microsoft 365 subscription with Teams. Are you going to have to go and use something like Zoom or or something you know mm -hmm. lesser of lesser of the collaboration tools and so um and of course you know this is an opinion but um the other thing too is the biggest i think and this is is it's not a technology but again it's the culture and if you don't have if the culture isn't in place to support that and and you know having the the sense of inclusion and in everything that you're doing um that goes along with the technology it's, it's just not going to take take off right yeah and i think um you know something else that I'm I'm you know passionate about, but I just you know thinking about uh, you know the last six months of my job. So I'm back in a company that really believes in the social side of the of the the the, the company culture as well. Um, having so all of our work getting done in Teams, for example, that in that structure, you've got the knowledge, the capture that with the SharePoint that's in the back end, but we also have our you know SharePoint infrastructure. But when we have Yammer, and I know there are other tools that are out there, and some people utilize Teams as also kind of that social interaction. But there's different scenarios for that. But I think the larger the organization, the more important it is to have that place that's just broad and open and more community focused mm -hmm. discussions and a lot of activity that's not work or project or customer related specifically but are about you know the health and and well-being of the employees and our our passions and our like and family and pictures of our pets and 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 have those conversations that help balance everything that we're yeah. doing and to further develop the relationships are increasingly important uh, the larger the organization 100%. Yep. 
because it could be it, it, it's 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 easy to get lost in and uh, be, feel forgotten in the larger the organization is. So mm-hmm. I don't think it's as much a problem. If there's 20 of you. You're usually in pretty constant contact across those yes. 20 people. So. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, happy hours, things like that, you know, yeah. bring, bring, you know, not, not work related, just getting together for a virtual drink or something. It's like having an open mic. And it's like, what do you want to talk about? What, what's out yeah. there? What's going on? What are you concerned about? Some of those conversations go back towards work topics, but other times it goes, goes sideways. You know, exactly. It's, it's nothing yeah, wrong with those, those. Those are the best meetings. Those are a lot of fun. Those are the memorable ones. So number six was in a hybrid work model, what are some best practices to ensure inclusivity? So my biggest thing when we're dealing in this sort of a situation, um, I deal in a lot of projects day to day and you know we have members coming in, members uh, being part of these conversations and these meetings and, and discussions. And I think a big thing um, when you are dealing with a lot of different people coming and going and things like that. Make sure you you introduce and, and introduce them or have them introduce themselves. Get an idea because now you get that connection, right? So when when you're having a meeting, when you're having a, a hybrid model, there, it, it's it's not just about connecting, saying your two bits and getting off. It's about being, being able to connect and work together in this situation. And so if you you know if you have a chance to introduce people, um, introduce yourselves. Um, a big thing here, and, and I know it's impossible really to, to mandate, but encourage video calls. Turn your video on. You know, let people see your face. You know, let them see your visual, visual cues. Myself, um, and you know, uh, yourself too, Christian, you know, speaking at conferences and things like that. You know, conferences, they moved into a hybrid model. They did the virtual things for a while, um, and, and they're slowly moving back to in-person now. Um, but, I, I, you know, I thought we could do it, and I, I, we did, but I didn't like it. I like being in the room, being able to, you know, get the visual cues and, and things like that. And that's why video calls are so important. Um, and again, it's, it's not possible really to enforce that, but it is, you know, to encourage it. Um, I will say a couple of things. I actually kind of sat back on this one because I, I was actually looking for some best practices myself beyond those things I, I talked about. One of the key things here, and this is especially for those of you in, the, in the, like those of us in the, in the service industry where we're providing a service to others, um, is be very cognizant of, uh, as John White said this, of time zones. And, and that's a huge right. thing. Like right now, what time is it for you right now, Christian? It's uh, 6.32 p.m. Oh, so you're in the same time zone as I am. So that's right. not a big deal. Yeah. But most of my people are are two hours ahead of me. Um, I work in a project right now where we, we actually cross four very different time zones. And someone, if you need to have everyone on the call, someone's staying up at midnight. Like it's it's just the way it is. You got to be very co- cognizant of that. Yeah. So you know the things like that. It's simple things too. Making sure there's a phone number to call in if you don't have the ability to to connect online. Yeah. Well, this is a again. This goes back to uh, uh, you know my the, my earlier comment about um, uh, you know that that uh, I, knowing your stakeholders. So part of the set the setup preparing for a meeting, having that that focus out there. Part of that is understanding who the stakeholders are, where they're coming from, mm-hmm. um, especially if you know you've got like your, uh, let's say you have, a, and I did this for, for years, um, worked with an engineering team in India, worked with uh, architects that were in Toronto and down in Sydney, Australia. Those were fun meetings where I was in Pacific time zone talking with India and Australia and a counterpart that was over in Toronto and trying mm-hmm. to find those right times. My yep. meeting started at 10 p.m. Uh, the Toronto guy joined not every night, but at 1 a.m. it started for him. Yeah. Just yeah. brutal, brutal. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, you know, so, so understanding that, but then also recognizing that uh, different people like to contribute in different ways and, and participate in different ways. Some people will get on and they may have their camera on, but they're just very quiet. And then as soon as the meeting is wrapped up or they might be adding notes and chatting over on the side is watching that conversation, they maybe compile a long email around that. Um, or they may, you know, have time to kind of absorb that and come back with questions and other mm-hmm. comments and things is to provide those kind of different speeds and different methods of communicating together 
And just be aware of that as you learn about the styles of those stakeholders in that organization so that everyone feels like they're heard. Yeah. And I realize that we're moving fast sometimes and we need to get things done and we need people to be upfront with their their thoughts. But sometimes it just takes time, again, for them to think about it and what they went through and then come back and say, you know what? Like I've thought about it, but here's how I would approach this. and and giving them that stage, that mm-hmm. opportunity to come in and share the feedback. The The other thing I was just going to comment on, um, I, I used it as an example. Um, years ago, was living in, outside of Sacramento, California. Um, I bought a motorcycle and commuted for a year on that bike. Mm-hmm. And pretty dry, usually clear weather. So it was, it was a fine commute, yep. uh, not very far. Just, uh, you know, got on the freeway, two exits, you know, back off the freeway. So not so bad. Um, usually took back roads and things. Um, the experience I had, I it was one year. What ended it was it was parked. Thankfully, I wasn't on it when it was hit by a car. Somebody smashed it pretty good while mm. it was parked overnight. Uh, and I went back to a car. But what I found is that having ridden on a bike for a year, how aware I was back as a car driver of all the motorcycles mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, in, in uh, talking with other people that rode you know, or still ride. And they'd always reflect on that. Like it would be great if everyone was required to go and get certified on a motorcycle as well as a, as an automobile, um, how much more aware we would be of motorcycles. I like it. I tell that story because I really hope, that you know as a best practice that we don't lose what we just learned from this experience that we don't you know people don't go back in the organization and then which was frustrating for somebody that's that's worked remotely for over 11 years and discussions areas products activities that i owned but i would be cut out of the conversation because they forgot to include the person who was three time zones away yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, and so we just can't forget that. No, that's that's a great thing. To, that's a great point to bring up. Yeah. So the final question, David, was uh, what are your predictions for the modern workplace in three to five years? That's a hard one because technology is moving so far and being able to allow us to do so much. Um, I actually think that, and I, we've talked about this a lot today. We talked a lot about it in the Tweet Jam as well. Um, I think that the modern workplace isn't going to be just about the technologies that allow us to collaborate. It's not going to be about the SharePoint. It's not going to be about the Teams. Um, Although a lot of it will be about those because they're the leading products. They (laughs) are, but but they are the tools that get you there, right? Um, Just being being the funny shill. It's all good, man. It's all good. You drink Kool-Aid, right? Uh, So, you know, it's, 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 it's about going, you know, it's about being able to be able to to do what you need to do how you feel comfortable doing it you know there's a lot i work with guys who are fantastic people the fantastic workers they don't feel comfortable in an office space and that's just their own you know you put them in front of a put them in front of a a, 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 a mic they don't even have to have a camera on and we kind of talk about i'm forcing that but maybe some people you just you just can't but they can they can speak eloquently they can uh, they can work with others. They can collaborate. They just don't feel comfortable in an office setting. On the other hand, you know, there's people I, you know what I miss most about the office is going to get a cup of coffee and looking over a cubicle and having a chat. You know, you can't do that. So being serendipitous a, encounters. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You, you don't have that. Like Literally, I have a, I'm having a meeting with a friend tomorrow. I booked a half hour just so him and I could connect because we just don't have that ability, right? So yeah. being able to, the modern workplace to me is being able to do just that. If you want to go to the office, you can work in the office. If you don't need to work in the office, you don't have to. You have the tools to allow you to do the work you need to do from wherever you need to do. You have the um, the processes in place to ensure there's inclusion in all things. Going back to your comment, making sure that people are involved and, and, and have their have their say. So I think to me, that is where the modern workplace is going. 
Yeah, it's funny. It's been over a decade now, the whole bring your own device. Mm-hmm. It's been closer to 15 years. And how difficult it was, and, and organizations had valid reasons for refusing to allow people to have personal devices that would access work, you know, uh, 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 information and and uh and, and so uh, while that's still something that organizations need to be you know thoughtful about how they manage that but there's a lot more flexibility now uh and so with the you know vpn just uh, you know software-based vpns how easy yeah. that is to to kind of put the container around the walls around the the guide the guide guide rails mm-hmm. around how we work across the various devices and things be right. I think one of the comments that I made um, it, during the tweet jam was uh, that I think it'll be easier to transition b- between. Like we're even seeing this. I love the feature in Teams. If you're sitting in a meeting, you're sitting in a recording or something. You're like, hey, you know, the the meeting is still going. We're going to go another twenty minutes, but I need to leave because I need to go pick up my child from school. Yep. You know, and so you can actually transfer it, transfer it to your phone. Yep. And continue listening in, and then when you get the you know, pick up your child, you get home, transfer it to your home system, yep. and it's you know seamless to the rest of the participants of the meetings. I think one of the things that I, I feel is is missing you get with the special devices that have the cameras that that pick up on depending on who's speaking the very expensive devices um, for a conference room. I would love to see that capability, and I think that's part something that is coming, mm-hmm. so that all of our cameras, all of our devices for our personal devices, will automatically have that capability. So we'll have a more seamless, multi-screen, multi-location experience yeah. where the software, like Teams, will be able to recognize if you're sitting in a room there with three other people, that it will just dynamically be it pulled between whoever's um, speaking, speaking yeah. and pick up on that. So yeah. I think that's going to be an important part too, to make that a yeah. more fluid process. You know, the other thing I was thinking about too, is, as we were chatting here, the one thing is going to be a big change in the modern, modern workplace. You know, granted you have worked from home for a long time, but when was the last time you printed something for work? Oh, for work. Yes. For work. Yeah, that's just because I was printing some stuff for my wife yesterday. Yes. <laughs> but guarantee. for work, yeah. I don't remember the last time I printed something work related. Yeah, I, I actually think this is this is the this is the starting of the nails in the coffin for for a for a papered office. I think that because you no know, most most businesses now have worked for almost two years remotely, where they didn't have to go print out a report to sign. You you have the digital signing software now. You have all that sort of thing. So I think that's. I really think that's a big thing that's going to come in the next three to five years. You are not going to have paper. It's funny. We've been talking about moving away from paper for over 20 years. Oh, yes. You know, <laughs> uh, longer than that. I mean, I, that was, again, some of you, if you've worked in IT, you know, for the last 30 years, they've mm-hmm. been talking about that. Yeah, my first effort to go paperless was when I was working for EDS in like 1992. Mm-hmm. And I was digitizing a lot of our, uh, you know, our, our uh, engineering documentation for uh, our platforms. It was that was yeah. a major project. In fact, it what was that? It was uh, uh, now I forget it. it. Was like this HTML based um, boy. But would have been cool if I remember the product name. This this ancient. <laughs> anyway, well. David, really appreciate uh, your time and, and joining uh, and, and talking about uh, the discussion today and participating, of course, in the Tweet Jam. It was, my, it was my pleasure, Christian. Thanks for having me. So it's great. And for those that, again, the Collab Talk Tweet Jam is uh, er, almost every month. We've been pretty mm-hmm. consistent. Yeah. Almost every month since uh, January of 2012. It's been going for a long time. So yeah. thanks again to Tygraph for, for, uh, and AvPoint for sponsoring and Tygraph for providing all the stats. And you can find out more uh, and find this, uh, you know, the video, of course, will be out on the Cloud Talk page out on YouTube, but you can find more on my blog on buckleyplanet.com. Anyway, David, thanks a lot for your time. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you.